Hello and welcome back to the subsidence and deformation session. This is the third of four sessions, and of course, there will be a host session later today. My name is Tatsu Strozzi, and I'm chairing this session together with Maya Elievia. We have five talks, five presenters, and as you all probably know, you have the opportunity to ask questions to Sraidu. If you do so, please start your question with an at and the name of the presenter. And by doing so, we can then easily identify who should answer the question at the end of the session when we will have time for that in the Q&A time slot. I think we can move to the first presenter, Anurak Kuljrecha of the University of Twente in the Netherlands. He will talk about modeling of sinkhole shape, spatiotemporal deformation patterns using INSAR phase time series. So Anurak, you have 15 minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairperson. Um, uh, hello, everyone. Today, I will talk about uh, my research titled Modeling of Sinkhole Shaped Spatiotemporal Deformation Patterns Using Insar Phase Time Series. Here, I would like to acknowledge my co authors, Dr. Ling Chang and Professor Alfred Stein, who are my PhD supervisors at ITC University of Twente. Um, uh, in my talk, I will first uh, introduce the problem of sinkholes and uh, how we have modeled them in the past. and the motivation for uh, my methods, uh, which is titled as uh, sinkhole scanner. And then I will uh, present my results on a simulated as well as on a, a real case study over a sinkhole on in Ireland. And then I will finally conclude. Um, so to introduce uh, sinkholes, we already know uh, that sinkholes are extreme natural and sometimes man-made events, uh, which cause a sudden collapse of the earth, Earth's surface. Um, and they majorly occur uh, in karst terrains where there's, because of the dissolution of underground material, uh, a cavity forms which migrates upwards and uh, cause the, causes the above material to subside. Uh, this uh, happens majorly in karst terrains. Um, an example of uh, a sinkhole uh, can be seen on the right, which is the sinkhole in Ireland. Uh, sinkholes have been studied in the past using NSAR. Uh, an example of which uh, can, uh, can be seen on the left, where uh, a sinkhole in Limburg in the Netherlands was studied uh, using uh, ERS and radar sat data. And uh, the time series of two points, uh, uh, one over a sinkhole area and the other not over a sinkhole area were compared. And uh, we could see uh, significant, significantly higher deformation velocity for the point uh, lying above the sinkhole and also uh, a sudden acceleration just before uh, the sinkhole occurrence. Uh, this way we can observe uh, deformation uh, anomalies in time series of PS points. Uh, in another way, we can say, uh, uh, see on the figure on the right, a spatial pattern uh, in the wrapped interferogram phase. Um, and here we see um, a, evolution of a Gaussian shaped uh, sinkhole pattern, uh, which can be seen uh, over a region in Israel. Um, but we want to combine these two aspects uh, of uh, spatial as well as uh, temporal monitoring of uh, sinkholes and to make a combined model uh, using both CCS location, uh, PS locations as well as their deformation time series. To do this, uh, we look at uh, different shapes of sinkholes, which uh, uh, are usually uh, which are usually followed by uh, by sinkholes. One is a Gaussian shaped uh, sinkhole, a cylindrical sinkhole, and a conical sinkhole, which can be seen on the um, top row of um, of this slide. And on the bottom row, we uh, modeled them using uh, functional models uh, inspired by these shapes. Uh, so a Gaussian shape and a cylindrical shape and a conical shape. And this uh, we use uh, in combination with the INSAR uh, PS points as well as their deformation time series. Uh, and the idea of uh, this research is to recreate this, uh, these kind of patterns in the um, uh, in the deformation data that we collect over the PS time series. The uh, problem here, however, is that the PS uh, data sets are uh, sparsely uh, placed and uh, they are non-homogeneous, uh, so therefore uh, it is sometimes difficult to recreate these kind of Gaussians, but we have attempted to do so. So in order to do this, uh, we first of all uh, define the mathematical models 
for each of these functions. Uh, for example, we see um, the inverted Gaussian model uh, in the first column of this uh, table shown uh, where the function f uh, def defines the spatial and temporal evolution of this Gaussian pattern. Uh, and this it is decomposed into a temporal component, uh, it, which uh, is taken to be a linear, uh, linearly evolving uh, function. And the second part is uh, Gaussian function, which we are uh, used to seeing, uh, which is an exponential function uh, of the spatial coordinates of the of the PS time or PS points. Uh, how do we model it? Uh, we uh, send as an input the CCS locations as well as their uh, deformation uh, time series into a mathematical model, which is defined uh, by an expectation operator. Uh, which is defined uh, by a functional model as well as uh, a stochastic model. The functional model is um, defined as the expectation of the deformation observation vector and is uh, equal to the product of the design matrix and the vector of unknowns. Uh, the dispersion uh, operator defines uh, the, co the uh, various covariance matrix of the observations and that defines the quality of each of the observations. Then we uh, linearize the model if uh, there's a non-linear non function for example in this case uh, of the gaussian function um, we linearize it so that we can perform le uh, fitted least squares estimation so here uh, the equation represents uh, a logarithmic transformation of the of the inverted gaussian function then uh, after that after creating the function and the stochastic uh, model we uh, applied the weighted least squares to identify uh, or estimate the estimator of the uh, unknown uh, unknown parameters, and here uh, we use um, a, a QDD matrix, which is a scaled um, matrix of the cofactor co co matrix, and the dimension is uh, of this matrix is BM times BM, uh, where B is the number of points and M is the number of epochs. Um, how does uh, this uh, scanning procedure? Uh, uh, follow, uh, we first of all define the uh, dimensions of the moving window size, which is used for scanning uh, by its uh, window size in the east and the north direction, as well as its stride parameter uh, in both the directions with which it will move in both the directions. After that, we intersect the uh, INSAR points uh, by this moving window. And if the number of intersect points is uh, greater than two, we attempt to solve the model equation using the uh, CCS points and the deformation time series. Uh, after fitting the model, we estimate the residuals um, uh, of the model uh, after fitting the model. And we use as a quality metric here, uh, the uh, posterior variance, which can be shown and uh, seen in the equation at the bottom. Uh, after that, we move the window size using uh, the stride parameter and then repeat this procedure over the entire study area. Uh, with, with that addressed, uh, we move on to description of the study area and uh, data sets. The, uh, we cover a sinkhole which occurred on uh, 26th, 25th uh, uh, September 2018, and it was a wide sinkhole which has a, had an extent of 100 meters in diameter. We collected 75 uh, Sentinel 1A SAR images uh, uh, over this uh, study area. In Figure A, we can see the uh, the uh, this burst as well as the the whole swath of the Sentinel 1 image, uh, which intersected this uh, study area. In Figure B, we can see the zoomed-in area over the the sinkhole site, and below which there's a gypsum mine. Uh, uh, we can see just at the south of uh, the sinkhole site in figure B. The sinkhole site is shown in, as the red dot. In figure C, we see the, um, the uh, aerial image of, uh, of the sinkhole. And in D, we see uh, the cropped uh, study area, which is used for the further for the processing. We uh, apply uh, standard PSI processing, uh, and uh, we get about 46,000 points over the study area we can see a general a stable trend in the in, uh, in the points behavior and but the interesting part is the uh, is in the zoomed in figure over this 
uh, study area or the sinkhole site uh, on the right figure, where we see uh, just south of the uh, sinkhole site, shown in the red ellipse, um, there is a cluster of uh, red points which are, are deforming uh, quite significantly with a fast velocity. Um, we try our method, uh, uh, as I said, on both uh, simulated as well as real case. In this case, I define, uh, my I define the simulation and my results in the, sim the simulation case. Uh, we simulate the uh, deformation over the PS uh, points by finding the value of the uh, the functional model over the PS points, and we add uh, a Gaussian uh, noise with uh, zero mean and sigma square variance. Uh, we do this in a, a minimum mapping unit of 10 by 10 meters over the entire grid size, uh, over the entire study area of 63 by 43 kilometers. Uh, we start from a depth of uh, 5.5 uh, millimeters to 100 millimeters uh, over uh, a temporal baseline of four years approximately four years, and uh, we get a deformation time series uh, with a velocity of the center of about 25 millimeters per year. On the right, we see the simulated sinkholes. Um, and in this uh, zoomed in region, we see uh, the, uh, the regularly placed sink sinkholes, uh, which were created using a two kilometer by two kilometer window size. We see that the in intersected points uh, over these uh, simulated sinkholes. With this, uh, we plot the uh, the simulated deformation time series of uh, the PS points, uh, uh, and we see over the, the that the velocity of the points which are at the center of the sinkhole is quite high, uh, of about uh, 25 uh, millimeters per year, and the points which are uh, at the peripheries of the sinkhole shows a stable trend. We tested uh, our method. Uh, our sinkhole scanner on uh, uh, studying whether our scanner could identify uh, the similar sinkholes. And we could, uh, in this um, figure on the bottom right, uh, at the zoomed in map, we can see that there's a, re there's a regular pattern on, of uh, relatively low uh, posterior variance values over uh, regions uh, which are at the center of the sinkhole. And this uh, uh, pattern is consistent over the entire time series. So this, with this result, we can say that the method works well in identifying uh, the Gaussian bell-shaped pattern in the simulated area. We tried it, uh, our method in the real case as well. And this is the, these are the interesting parts uh, of the results. Um, we use four different scanners with four different window sizes uh, of uh, two kilometers, one kilometer, 500 meter, and 100 meters. Uh, and we got interesting result, which uh, we did not observe in the uh, did not observe clearly in the deformation velocity map, which is uh, uh, a gradually decreasing value of perceived variance values as we move towards the center of the the sinkhole, which is marked as with the red, red ellipse uh, here. Um, and this uh, actually becomes uh, this convergence becomes evident in this uh, one kilometer by one kilometer um, this uh, window size. And we keep reducing it, uh, and by reducing the uh, window size, uh, we get better resolution maps, but at the cost of the uh, the scanning area. Um, we reduced our uh, window size to 100 by 100 meter, but uh, we observed that uh, that over the sinkhole site, uh, there were no intersection of enough points so to be able to recreate this Gaussian pattern. Uh, and this became the limit, uh, limit for the window size. Um, so uh, with this qualitative assessment, we can concluded that uh, that we have demonstrated uh, the application of sinkhole scanners in detecting um, uh, sinkhole shapes. In this case, we showed Gaussian shaped sinkholes, and we uh, we showed on both uh, synthetic data as well as uh, Central One uh, real SAR data uh, a trend uh, of gradually varying um, or rather reducing variance was uh, observed over the. Uh, over the sinkhole area with the maximum variation of be, being 40% in this uh, one kilometer window size. We observed that there was uh, a trade-off between the scanning area and the selected window size. Um, and uh, there was, uh, if we have a priori information about the, the window size, uh, about the 
uh, nature of sinkholes uh, and the size of it, we can that can help us in choosing the appropriate window size and the appropriate sinkhole model. Uh, we also see that the uh, PS spatial density uh, with respect to sinkhole size was an important limiting factor uh, in choosing the the window size. Uh, so with that said, I want to conclude and uh, say thank you. And that's all my presentation. Thank you, Anurag. As I said before, we will answer the questions at the end of the session. So we move to the next talk. Maya. Thank you very much, Fazio. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to co-chair this session. My name is Maya Ilieva. And the next speaker will be Ran Nov, who will present a processing system for monitoring of sinkhole precursors. Ram? Hello. I hope Hello. you can hear me. Yes. OK. Um, so uh, thank you very much. And uh, I would like uh, to present a sinkhole uh, early, warning, early warning system. Uh, developed uh, at the Geological Survey uh, of Israel. Uh, it's an operational uh, system uh, for almost a decade now, uh, with the help of uh, various uh, collaborators and uh, from different uh, institutions. Uh, okay. Uh, so you can see here uh, in the map the location of the the Dead Sea uh, and. Uh, on the left side, you can see the water level um, drop of the um, of the of the Dead Sea in recent decades. The uh, water levels are dropping at a, a rate of over a meter per year, and accordingly, uh, sinkholes are exponentially uh, um, uh, evolving, and the cumulative number reaches uh, over uh, six thousand uh, sinkholes um, by the end of uh, two thousand sixteen. On the on the map uh, to the right, you can see the location of these sinkholes along the western side uh, of the Dead Sea. The eastern side is uh, uh, Jordanian, and the western side is Israel. The mechanism for the sinkhole formation is uh, based on uh, halite layer uh, dissolution. The halite layer is spread along the coast at a depth of about uh, 20 meters with the width and uh, uh, width of five meters. And uh, until uh, 1970, the Dead Sea water, le water levels were high and the Dead Sea is hypersaline. So the water of the Dead Sea cannot dissolve the, the salt anymore. But then, uh, since then, the, the water levels are dropping and uh, the, the salt layer the salt water is receding and ground, fresh groundwater is in contact with the salt layer. This uh, creates uh, uh, the solution of, of the salt, uh, creating subsidence at uh, rates of as little as uh, half millimeter per day and uh, cavities which eventually collapse into sinkholes. So these uh, sinkholes pose a great uh, hazard uh, to the area affecting uh, daily life, tourism, agriculture, uh, roads. Um, as you can see in the, in the pictures, the, the main uh, uh, um, economic uh, uh, um, prospects in, in the area are, are agriculture or, or uh, tourism. Uh, and this affects uh, the area very much. So until uh, 2011, the sinkholes were uh, were uh, identified using orthophotos, uh, uh, airborne orthophotos, and since 2011, we use uh, also lidar data. These data are um, high resolution, half meter per pixel, and uh, uh, very high uh, uh, accuracy on the vertical uh, um, side. You can see here an example from uh, the Ling River fan. On the right, you can see a drone uh, image, and on the left, the corresponding LiDAR data. And uh, the sinkhole uh, pits are very uh, easy to detect. The sinkholes themselves are associated with subsidence before, during, and after their collapse. 
And you can see here the same uh, uh, LIDAR data from 2018. And on the left is uh, an interferogram. It's uh, an 11 uh, day interferogram, Terrasar X, three meters by three meters. And you can see the subsidence is not overlapping uh, directly the open pits. Uh, it's it's much uh, wider area. You can see in the white arrow the uh, a dirt road passing uh, in this uh, in this area. And then when we look at the uh, lidar from uh, 2020, you can see the new sinkhole uh, where it used to be uh, uh, where it was identified before with the subsidence. So in this image, uh, you can see the effect of the high resolution uh, uh, LiDAR data. We use it as our uh, DM uh, layer for the elevation corrections of the interferometric uh, pair. This is the same interferogram. On the right, we use the uh, 30 meter uh, GDM or SRTM is, it would, would result the same. Uh, um, and and you cannot easily detect the, the single uh, associated uh, uh, subsidence. But on the left, this is the same interferogram using the LiDAR uh, uh, data with a vertical accuracy of uh, uh, 25 centimeters. So this allows us to detect the subsidence uh, related to the sinkholes. I would like to show you an example of a successful uh, warning. This is uh, along uh, Route 90 near uh, Kibbutz and Gedi. So Kibbutz and Gedi is a settlement, and Route 90 is the is is the main highway, and effectively it's the only uh, road connecting the southern part of the Dead Sea and the northern part of the Dead Sea on its uh, west coast. You can see in the um, on the left here the um, uh, Route 19 uh, uh, going in the middle of the of the image. And then uh, highlighted in color, the areas um, uh, subsided between uh, 2011 and 2005 using LiDAR differential map. This uh, area used to be a, a campground, uh, a touristic uh, resort, and uh, it was closed in 1998 after several uh, injuries of people falling into uh, open pits. But you can see that the road itself uh, shows no uh, subsidence, and this is partly due to uh, uh, geotechnical sheets that were placed underneath the road in 2002. These geotechnical sheets are very strong, and they are aimed at uh, stopping uh, vehicles or anything or, or the road itself to collapse into uh, an, an open uh, cavity if it develops under the under the road itself. But then, when we look at the interferograms. And this is a Cosmos SkyMed interferogram from uh, 2011. You can see the road itself shows no uh, uh, subsidence. You can see uh, areas uh, to the west and to the to the east of the road, uh, which shows the the subsidence, uh, ongoing subsidence during that time. And uh, when we look on interferograms uh, since uh, uh, August, since September 2012. We identified, started to identify uh, subsidence on top of the road. It took us uh, some time to convince uh, the National Road Authority that there is actually any subsidence there, in fact, uh, because they are using um, optical leveling, but uh, it's too sparse. And this uh, subsiding area is uh, 20 meters in diameter. So only once they densified their measurements, they approved our findings of uh, subsidence. And during the following years, uh, sinkholes started to appear on the margins of the road, about 10 meters from uh, the road to the, to the west. Uh, they were filled with the gravel to prevent people from falling inside, uh, but they were keep on uh, going. There were several uh, uh, sinkholes uh, appearing and only in uh, 2015, uh, the first cracks uh, appeared on the road itself. And of course, uh, we um, uncovered the asphalt and uh, looking for, for any cavity underneath. And we found a nine meter deep, five meter in diameter uh, sinkhole. 
So this uh, uh, um, time span between uh, 2012 and 2015, almost two and a half years, uh, allowed uh, ample time to uh, to uh, uh, build a detour. And you can see here, uh, looking to the south, this is uh, the settlement, Kibbutz and Gedi, Route uh, 90 and the detour, the new detour. And this area, uh, maybe you can see the, the cracks around the sinkholes. And these are an example of the wildlife in this area. I recommend uh, visiting this uh, uh, region. And only in 2017, the road itself, the, the geotechnical sheets uh, finally yield and uh, uh, cavities uh, emerged in on the road. So this is uh, one uh, successful example. You can see here um, uh, some of the of the data summarized. So you can see here our interferogram uh, measurements, and we use single interferograms. You can see the time span in uh, black here, and uh, compared with the uh, optical uh, leveling in uh, dotted green uh, line. And the gray areas are the are the reason for using uh, individual interferograms and not using uh, uh, traditional uh, time series. These uh, gray areas are where we encountered uh, massive decorrelation uh, in this area. So the arrows uh, represent the timeline of, of this uh, story. The first subsidence identified in uh, yellow, the first alert uh, to the National Road Authority in orange, the additional uh, sinkholes, uh, the margins of the road in blue, and the final uh, um, uh, sinkhole discovered underneath the, the road is in uh, red. So since uh, then, we have a, a, a semi-automatic uh, monitoring system and alerting system. So we use uh, we have in our uh, archive over 200 uh, um, Cosmos SkyMed images and uh, over 220 Terrasar X images, uh, high resolution. We use the SLC images, no uh, uh, multi-looking, three by three meter per, per uh, pixel, and uh, uh, high uh, accuracy lidar data. Um, and and the system is automatically checking for new uh, images finding the uh, uh, previous uh, main uh, uh, image, create the interferogram, and send an automatic uh, message uh, to, to us for manual inspection. Then we take the interferograms and identify new uh, subsiding areas or uh, collapsed uh, sinkholes where we identify uh, the correlation in the center of uh, of um, a subsiding area, and we can send the, the alert to the authorities. We've uh, created a, a web-based, uh, leaflet-based uh, web interface uh, for the analysis. Uh, we take the raster images of the interferograms and uh, convert them into tiles, similar to the way it's presented in uh, uh, Google Maps, for example, the, the imagery of, of Google Maps. and. Um, uh, we can uh, use that to mark the uh, the subsidence. You can see here an example. We have layers of the sinkholes marked in in uh, black. Uh, new subsidence are marked in uh, yellow uh, um, polygons. Ongoing uh, um, on ongoing subsidence is marked in orange. So after we we create reports monthly and uh, uh, a new subsidence the next month will uh, uh, become orange. Uh, and then if the polygons intersect known and mapped uh, um, sinkholes or identify the sinkholes by decorrelation, it will be marked in uh, red polygons. And this is used for our uh, internal uh, purposes. Uh, and for the stakeholders, uh, we pre publish the, the polygons in uh, uh, ESRI uh, GIS publishing tools. Sorry? One minute. Yes. Uh, okay. So this is uh, the same area. This is what the stakeholders uh, would see. Um, oh, sorry. And in the next month, you can see the, the yellow mark here, and it will turn uh, orange. So this is an, an open access uh, system. And to summarize, um, we have the automatic uh, processing. 
uh, ongoing for uh, over uh, almost a, a decade now. Uh, we detect uh, using a manual inspection, we detect the, the sinkholes and the subsidence, and we wish to integrate machine learning and more sophisticated uh, uh, automatic processes uh, for the detection phase. Uh, then the alert uh, of new subsidence or new sinkhole based on uh, the correlation is sent, is sent to the stakeholders, uh, which deliver it to uh, find the engineering solution like the detour I showed in uh, uh, near Engedi. So I thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sharon. Patio? Yes, we move to the next talk. Next talk will be given by Farnoush Oseirini from the Simon Fraser University in Burnaby, Canada. And she will be talk about three-dimensional displacement of the active lobe of Fels Glacier Slide, Alaska, measured with multi-station terrestrial radar interferometry. Farnoush, you have 15 minutes. Please. Yeah, the share button is not active for me. <laughs> okay, now. Uh, okay, hello everyone, this is Fanush. Welcome to this presentation about three-dimensional displacement of the active lobe, a lobe of Fells Glacier Slide, Alaska, measured with multi-station terrestrial radar interferometry. This work was done by SFU Sardab and in collaboration with the University of Alaska. The project was financially supported by the Alaska Pipeline Service Company. This is the overview of the presentation. Uh, Fels Glacier Slide is located in northern slope of the best face uh, facing Fels Glacier Valley in Alaska, USA. Uh, it's an active deep sea gravitational slope deformation. This slide is in the proximity of key infra infrastructures, including Richardson Highway and Trans Alaska Pipelines, and is neighbored by Denali Fault. There are numerous deformation features, including joints and cracks, uh, cracks observed over this area. Uh, the formation rates ranges from less than a millimeter to several centimeters per month and are spatially and temporally variable within the slope. Our focus for this study is the westernmost part of the slide, uh, which is also the most active part of it. It's highlighted in red in the figure. Uh, the, the proximity of this slide to critical infrastructure structures and potential safety and environmental concerns create a need for proactive detailed observation and modeling of the slide motion. Uh, Ground-based radar interferometry has been widely used with demonstrated success to monitor landslide and slope instability in both man-made and natural trains. Uh, advantages over spaceport insert include much higher temporal res resolution, which is in the order, or, order of minutes, as well as the potential to use several line of sight observations simultaneously to allow for accurate capturing of the full three dimensional uh, motion of landslides. Uh, it can also capture uh, the north-south displa displacement component that space-borne insert uh, geometries are uh, mostly insensitive to. Uh, we demonstrate the advantages of ground-based radar for the most active part of the Fells Glacier slide by acquiring high temporal resolution terrestrial radar images over the course of two. Uh, three-day field campaigns in July 2017 and July 2018. For each day of each um, campaign, uh, the data was recorded on a, a, approximately five-minute intervals. We used two gamma remote sensing portable radar interferometers, GPRI units, uh, from fixed locations at the opposing southern slope of the Falls Glacier Valley. So in this figure, you can see the locations of the GPRI units. Uh, they are marked as FSP1 and FSP2. Uh, this is for 2017 campaign. Uh, in order to get a stronger geometry with a better ability to capture the movement along the fall line and up directions of the slide, given the gravity-driven nature of its displacement, we decided to change the location of the station one, or here called FSP1, 
for uh, the 2018 campaign. Uh, we are also uh, trying to get a better scan coverage over the area of interest. Uh, we did analysis on different locations to predict the strengths of the observing geometry in target visibility. Uh, you can see five of these candidate locations in this figure marked uh, from C1 to C5. The table we are uh, looking at right now uh, summarizes the analysis that we carried out for these points. According to our analysis, uh, location C3 was perfect. We set up the radar given its stronger geometry and a full view of the tar target. Uh, so as a comparison, uh, we've plotted a measure of geometry strengths from the old FSP one location um, for uh, the 2017 campaign and the new suggested location. As you can see, the new location provides a stronger geometry that can capture the motion better. However, in practice, uh, it wasn't easy to move the radar to the location that we picked due to the rock falls that occurred in that area and made it harder for us to access that point. Uh, therefore, in the field, a point between C2 and C3 locations was selected to, to set up the radar. Uh, this point also provides, uh, provides a stronger geometry than the old one, and it also has a good uh, coverage of the area of the interest. You can see the, the new location of uh, station FSP1 in the figure. So uh, for our interferometry analysis of the final displacement field vectors, uh, we used um, differential uh, interferograms with three different temporal baseline configuration for each campaign. One, uh, acquisitions capture, captured over a full day from a single channel, two acquisitions captured at a uh, 120 min minutes interval from uh, a single channel and three, simultaneous acquisitions of the upper and lower receive channels of the GBRI. For each campaign and each station, the interprograms derived from the simultaneous acquisitions were used to generate a DM. The two-hour interprograms were used to drive the short-term deformation rates to generate the phase demodulation surfaces, like which I will cover later. And the uh, one-day ones were used to drive the longer term the formation race to extract the uh, motion vector field. To ensure reliable deformation rate information for the false glacier slide, it was essential to estimate and eliminate uh, atmospheric phase contribution from the interferograms. This was done by correlation analysis between contaminated interferograms phase and range over a stable region with a small enough range diversity to contain the phase within one to pi interval. To remove the dynamic atmospheric, uh, atmospheric phase, we used a least squares method to generate as, uh, atmospheric screens for each scene. On the right hand side of the screen, uh, you can see the original interfer, uh, the original interferogram between July 18th and July 19th, 2018, acquisitions from FSP1 station. The area selected uh, for the static atmospheric correction is highlighted in red. Uh, <clears throat> then uh, these are the, two, uh, the B and C are the two uh, dynamic screens um, for each scene involved in, uh, the, in generating the interferogram. And part D shows uh, the same interferogram after atmospheric correction. Uh, the daily atmospheric corrected interferograms were characterized by complex high frequency patterns due to surface displacement as well as numerous small regions of in incoherence. This resulted in a failure of standard uh, phase unwrapping algorithms. An alternative, uh, alternative demodulation approach was used instead that was based on the upscaling of highly coherent short term two hour interferograms with less than one fringe to match the temporal baseline of the daily interferograms. To avoid noise amplification, the scaled short-term interferograms were stacked, averaged, and smoothed to create a modeled full-day reference interferogram. 
the uh, the 24 hour interview programs were, were again demodulated using this model interview program resulting in a wrapped residual with reduced fringe density. The residual was then again smoothed and unwrapped using a MCF algorithm and added to the model interview program to produce a new iteration of the model phase. This process was repeated until a residual was recovered at full resolution and within a single fridge. Uh, here are the two examples uh, of the average absolute daily uh, deformation for the 2017 campaign from FSP1 and FSP2. The next step, we need to decode the unwrapped daily interprograms to retrieve the deformation field. To do so, for each campaign and each station, we extracted the surface topography using a, uh, acquired interprograms from simultaneous acquisitions of the upper and lower received channels and using the GPRI geometry. We did a crude geocoding using uh, the available metadata and field, measure, field measurements, including coordinates of GPRI station and rotation angles of the antenna. As our initial parameters were not accurate enough, we tried to refine the geocoding parameters to do so. Each model inside DEM was individually co-registered and georeferenced to an external LiDAR DM that was captured in uh, 2014. The refined core registration and geocoding parameters were extracted from a series of key points from the insert and reference DMs using a uh, SIFT algorithm. You can, uh, you can see the selected key points over the two DMs, the reference DM and the one generated from the GPRI. So once matched, the 3D coordinates of the key points were extracted and used to re retrieve the geocoding uh, parameters using BFGS optimization. This figure uh, shows the vertical registration error in the model DEMs from FSP1 and FSP2 after optimization. This is for the 2017 campaign. Finally, 3D decomposition of the measured daily deformation from the two line of sight directions for each campaign was carried out under the assumption that motion occurs only in the plane containing the slope's fall line and surface normal vectors since the slope uh, deformation is gravity driven. The applied decomposition equ equation for this problem is presented here. It should be noted that this approach breaks down. Uh, if the two sensor geometries are very similar. We used <coughs> regularization to reduce magnified errors in the solutions. Here are the final deformation maps in fall line and emergent directions for 2017 and 2018 campaigns. The resulting deformation maps reveal a discontinuous deformation vector field over the observed active uh, lobe of the slide. The maximum displacement was observed at uh, the exposed toe of the lobe. The toe is here. Um, I think it's pretty obvious, the, the, the one with the brighter color. Uh, where average deformation rates of eight, eight centimeters per day and three centimeters per day was measured in fall line and emergent directions. This is the emergent direction deformation maps. The formation was partially variable and widespread, but less than four centimeters per day in fall line direction higher up at the slope, which is like here. Um, this is consistent with earlier observations in the area. Uh, the exposed toe of the slope does appear to be bulging out and pushing into the valley at a rate of far more substantial than the deformation occurring at the upper slope. The noticeable bulging in the toe of the slope is indicative uh, of uplift associated with internal compression as the slide advances into glacier field valley. These observations are compatible with a higher degree of instability and pot potential risk of failure for at least part of the active uh, lobe of the slide. Again, to include ground-based insert, is a powerful short-term observation tool. The multi-station measurements of ground-based radar can contribute to understanding uh, the landslide, landslide's dynamics. Uh, for false glacier slide, 
as our selection of state uh, station locations was confounded by uh, the local environment, our ability to minimize the inversion errors was limited. As a result, isolated excessive deformation rates uh, were observed in some areas that were masked out. This can be improved further. Uh, despite the potential sources of error, the model does highlight the relatively substantial difference in the formation rate between the toe and upper part of the slope. This is the first detailed picture of the toe dynamics captured with the help of ground-based radar observation given, given its uh, short temporal baseline. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Farnoosh. We will take the, the questions at the end of the session. So we move to the next talk. And the next talk uh, will be given by, by Max Felius, uh, who will present uh, the TU Delft solution for a systematic sinkhole detection. Max? I could not find the unmute button. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay, then I'll, I'll, I'll start. Um, good af afternoon, everybody, and welcome. Uh, my name is uh, Max Felius, and I'm a graduate student at the TU Delft. Uh, today, I will give you a short presentation about part of my gradu graduation work. My work focuses mainly on the detection of precursory substance, which can be indicative of an uh, impending cover collapse. Uh, uh, impending cover collapse is more commonly known as uh, a sinkhole. So the displacement time series are computed using the persistent scatter instar method, and I will use this data to apply a new systematic detection method. So now going to my motivation. Um, in the summer of 2020, a cover substance sinkhole formed in the middle of the street in Kerkrade in the Netherlands. Sinkholes formed suddenly and with no prior indications. The cover substance sinkhole uh, was later attributed uh, to an ancient 300 year old mining shaft situated below the street. On the right hand side, you see a K collapse. This K collapse in the, uh, was, ha happened in the city center of Amsterdam, and the, the probable, probable cause was attributed to a sinkhole. So, still, um, was this cover substance or collapse preventable? Uh, sinkhole prone regions tend to be very extensive, and the size of a sinkhole is relatively small to that region. Also, the occurrence of a sinkhole is, uh, is a low probability event, making it very difficult to obtain useful data in the area of interest. We know that before collapse, precursory subsidence uh, is present, and, that we and if we have enough observations, uh, we might be able to detect this impending sinkhole before the catastrophic event happens, uh, before the catastrophic Collapse event happens. Recently, the Bodendales card in Dutch or ground motion uh, map in English uh, was launched. It's a map uh, showing the entire country of the Netherlands. On this map, different uh, PS points are visible, uh, showing various displacement rates at various locations. So th this map uh, shows that there's uh, a lot that there are a lot of observations available. Now, what we need right now is a good and systematic method to process all this data. So for this study, uh, we zoomed in on Kerkrade. Kerkrade is a city uh, that's situated in the southern part of the Netherlands uh, in the province called Limburg. Kerkrade is a, a single prone region. So when we zoom in on Kerkrade uh, to a very low street level, we still see that there is a lot of data available. The zoomed in area, this is the, so this is a zoomed in area. Um, this, not, this, not, this does not show anything particular out of the ordinary, but we also do not expect this because uh, sinkholes usually exhibit a sudden acceleration, uh, which it will not impact the velocities uh, that much. Uh, the velocities are shown here uh, by the coloring of the dots. Uh, still, a single scatterer could exhibit an acceleration or a single signal. And if it does, 
we want to be able to detect that before the collapse happens. So the aim of this research is to investigate a new method uh, that looks at incoming epochs and checks them for anomalous behavior. Sinkholes, sinkhole occurrence is a low probability event and unfortunately not present in this data set. Therefore, we implemented the sinkhole signal at the end of, the, of a real displacement time series. The reason for implementing this single signal is to preserve the point distribution and the original point at displacement time series. Our novel systematic detection method in this research will make use of arcs between points. So what are arcs? Arcs are connections between points. Uh, each point can form n minus one number of arcs, whereby n are the number of points in the subset. Using a large data set, will create a lot of arcs, as you can see here on the left side image. Large data sets will also tend to become very messy and compute computationally expensive. Therefore, small subsets are chosen. Here, we have a subset of only 61 points, but still it creates 1830 arcs. Arcs have the benefit of uh, subtracting out errors and regional signals affecting all points within that subset and therefore only small scale signals will be left over. So how are arcs computed? Arcs are computed by subtracting the displacement value of one point with the other. So in this case, um, subtracting the displacement value of point I with point J. The two points uh, I and J are there subst are subtracted from each other, creating a new deformation time series. This is the time series uh, um, for an arc between point I and J. In the following steps, uh, uh, I will show you uh, how we computed the noise level of an arc. Uh, we need this to test whether a newly acquired arc behaves as we would expect, or if we should flag it as behaving anomalously. But the first step is by def defining a linear model through the displacement time series to approximate the behavior. Using the linear least squares, the linear trend is estimated. From the linear trend, we can compute the residuals. With the residuals, we computed the histogram. Uh, the assumption we made here is that the residuals are distri distributed following a Gaussian function. In this way, we can compute uh, the mean and the standard deviation. The computed standard deviation of the residuals will then act as a proxy of how noisy an uh, arc is behaving. The computed standard deviation is then used to define the confidence interval of the displacement time series. The confidence interval is set here to a signif significance level of 5%, and that means that we have a confidence interval of 95%. With this confidence interval, uh, the next epoch can be tested whether it falls within the predefined interval or outside. When it falls outside our interval, uh, we are going to flag that particular arc. The benefit of computing the standard deviation using a histogram is that it's uh, very easy to do and it incorporates the volatility a displacement time series might have. Now, this slide uh, shows the displacement time series per point of the affected points within our area of the uh, where we implemented the artificial sinkhole. Um, the sinkhole we implemented here uh, makes use of a kinematic model. The kinematic model uh, uses a, an inverse Gaussian function to compute the displacement of each point on a specific date. Uh, the red end part here uh, of the signal, that's the, the right end part, shows the moment when this sinkhole was implemented. Uh, the single signal was roughly implemented at the beginning of July 2018, and you can clearly see that there is some display deformation happening or subsidence. Well, um, this is a short clip, and I will uh, play this clip and uh, talk over it. Using the previously described steps, uh, we can test whether a newly received point, or arc, I mean, sorry falls inside or outside our predefined interval. Here, uh, we used a fixed number of epochs to fit the linear model and compute the confidence intervals. In practice, uh, different update strategies can be implemented to better characterize an arc. 
The newly obtained epochs uh, are tested and flagged if they fall outside of our confidence interval. So when a new uh, epoch is outside or arc is outside the interval, it will be flagged and marked according to the number of times it was previously outside of the interval. I'll come on back to that in my next slide. So my next slide is also a, a short clip, short animation. Uh, I will start it uh, in the beginning and, it, and talk over it. It will keep on looping. So what we did here is testing the flagging procedure on a subset by an artificial sinkhole was implemented at the end of the time series. Here we see two figures. The left figure shows the flag arcs and the right figure shows the total value per point or observation. So first I will explain uh, the left side image. In this left side image, uh, each arc is characterized with a linear model. Then for every new epoch, the arc is tested and flagged if it falls outside the predefined confidence interval. In the left figure, you only see flagged arcs. So the non-flagged arcs are not plotted, They're thereby showing it a little bit less messy. Now I, now I will explain how the arc is colored. So if the arc is flagged for the first time, it will be shown in the left side image and it, will, and it will be given the color yellow. But also it will be given a flag count one. If it's flagged a second time in a row, uh, then, it's uh, then it's colored yellow, uh, red, I mean, and the flag count is increased to two. If it's flagged a third time or more in a row, it's flagged black and the flag count increased to three and keeping it at a flag count of three. If then the, the fourth epoch falls within the confidence interval and this is not flagged, the flag count will be reset to zero. The flag count ensures uh, a short-term memory and will be beneficial to the right side image. So coming to the right side image, uh, each, um, the right image shows each point or observation and is not uh, and are not the arcs. The total flag value on the y-axis uh, represents the sum of flag counts of each arc connected to that specific point on a specific epoch. Therefore, when a lot of uh, black flagged arcs go towards a specific point, uh, the total flagged value will be very high. So this is the last figure from the short clip in the previous slide. The left figure shows uh, a lot of black arcs towards few points in the center of the image. This is clearly visible in the right hand image. Three points exhibit a large total flagged value, and these points are indeed the points most affected by our implemented sinkhole. Concluding, uh, I've shown a, in my presentation an, uh, an R-based anomaly detection, which can act as a new systematic detection method. For each epoch, uh, we run uh, the same uh, flagging procedure to look for arcs which are behaving anomalously. Within the flagging of each arc, we implement the short-term memory in the form of a flag count. The method is robust since it uses all the arcs to work towards every single point. Testing a flagging procedure is based on a significance level, which, which is predefined. So, so we tried our methodology on a simulated data set uh, and saw some very interesting results. The province of Limburg has decided to implement an arc-based methodology. It's currently in development and hopefully we've seen, uh, and hopefully it's soon operational in the Netherlands. Uh, this was my talk, and uh, thank you very much for your uh, attention. Thank you very much, Max. We have now the last talk of the session. It's given by Gidon from the Geological Survey of Israel. Will the lowest streams of Earth sink and in our perspective? Hello, everybody. <clears throat> okay. Uh, as you heard already from Ran, uh, we're in an area which is uh, one of the highest uh, uh, evolving area on Earth, both in terms of uh, cast formation and in terms of uh, rapid uh, riverbed incision. 
and uh, I'm going to combine the two uh, by using uh, some uh, inside observations uh, that will help us better understand and uh, constrain some of the processes uh, that I will show. Uh, this side has been shown by Ran, just for those who haven't been uh, attending the, his talk. The basic mechanism for sinkhole formation is the uh, salt layer, which is uh, exposed to fresh groundwater, uh, that dissolves the salt, and then finally the sinkholes collapse. But I'm uh, talking about an additional player in the game, which has started in, uh, since 2010, when sinkholes started uh, developing in uh, riverbeds, and then flash floods I'm entered sorry. the... Uh, Gideon. Could you please activate the PPT? Uh, share it the full screen. The what? Can you share the presentation to the full screen? Uh, I think it's in the full. It's not in the full screen. It was not. It was. Uh, could you try again to share? Now. <clears throat> Could you please share the screen again? Mm. Most probably it was uh, the sharing was stopped and uh, Meanwhile, I would like to remind the, the audience that you can post your questions to the chat. Well, I'm not able now to share it anymore. Uh, no. Just next to the mute and video button, you have a share. Where? I have a share. I, I'm pointing on the share. It's connecting, but uh, showing me the connecting button. Is there any other button to? Um, no, it's just there next to, uh, down on the screen next to the mute and video button. Probably, uh, maybe it will take some time. Right now, it's so. What did you see before? Did you see the, the presentation, or didn't you see it at all? Uh, no, we don't see it. No, before uh, while be I was so before we were seeing it, but it was not uh, at the full screen. Could you try to share it again, please? So let me share now. Kiddy, I think I have the presentation. Maybe I can share and you can talk. Would that be possible? Yeah, that's possible. We have the backup too. On the okay, maybe the... backup would be so, better. Uh, whatever you wish. Yeah, well, okay. If I can't connect, then uh, show the backup. Okay. Um, so I, I suppose the technical team, they will share. Yes. It's okay now. Okay. Thank you very so, much. Please, uh, that, yes. Uh, next slide. 
Okay, so I, I was, is that okay now, full screen? Yes, it's very good. Okay, sorry about that. So uh, I was just mentioning that uh, sinkholes at the stream bed uh, enabled water, direct uh, flood water uh, to enter the sinkhole from above, infiltrate directly into the salt layer, expand the cavities much more rapidly than uh, by the groundwater, and then the, the uh, uh, salt saturated water continue, please press again, continue, continue downstream, uh, or I mean down to the eastern part of the Dead Sea, and the surface uh, and the uh, uh, discharge in sinkholes that are uh, along the Dead Sea shoreline. So uh, this is a, a new process that has started in 2010. So the next slide, please. And this has been summarized in uh, 2016. And next, in this talk, I will uh, show some uh, some. Uh, application of uh, uh, INSAR and, and coherence uh, to trace the subsurface flow path, to constrain the flood volume, uh, to quantify the post-flood uh, surface response, and finally speculate on the fate of the Dead Sea stream beds and the associated hazard. Yes, next one. I will uh, focus on uh, two uh, alluvial fans, the saline fan and the heavy fan, the southern part of the northern basin of the Dead Sea. The Salim on the left uh, had 15 active gullies during flash flood, but due to the generation of the canal, of the conduit of the pump, from a pumping station in the northern basin to the uh, southern basin, uh, there were overpasses over the canal for the uh, flood water, and currently only about eight uh, riverbeds flow during the flash flood. And on the right, in the Hever, there are two currently active uh, stream beds. Next slide. Uh, I will show now, in the next uh, few slides, I will show uh, flash, uh, snapshots from uh, time-lapse camera uh, movies that we made in the sinking areas where flash floods uh, entered the sinkhole. So first I will show two examples of sinking uh, floods. And next slide and one, one example of uh, the discharge at the bottom uh, sinkholes. So the next one, please move quite uh, rapidly. This is in the northern part in the Hever. You see the flash flood entering uh, the sinkhole, filling it up. Meanwhile, some water continues along, uh, the, uh, along the riverbed. Now in the Salim, you see the flash floods coming entering a bowl, in this case, one minute. In this case, it fills a bowl and it fills it totally, and then it starts dropping. While it drops, there's uh, some liquefaction and lateral spreading occurs. And then it finally drains uh, into the sinkhole without continuing all the way down to the Dead Sea on the surface. And the final set is in the place where the uh, water discharges about an hour or two after it's been swallowed in the sinkhole, it starts uh, rising in the near shore sinkhole. You can see the water coming up again, one more and one more and again, and then afterwards it drops and drains back into the sinkhole. So this is what happens uh, in many places along the Dead Sea. And you see here an example of eight places where the, the riverbeds sink in the Salim uh, fan and two places where the uh, water discharges, and uh, the, the southern one of the two is where in eight different sinkholes the water uh, rises. So, next one, please. Uh, we're looking now at a zoom of uh, the southern part of, of the fan. We see three sinking uh, areas, three sinkholes, or wide sinkholes where the uh, flash flood uh, are uh, entering the sinkhole, and one place where uh, the flash flood discharge. Next one, please. Next one also. And so the question we ask is, where are the subsurface dissolution paths for after these uh, flash floods? And the next slide will show us where they are. So we can see an interferogram of the late uh, 2018. And we can see the three sinking areas and we can see 
a belt of subsidence that connects the, the three, uh, between the three, between the northern and the uh, southern and the central one, and then a zone of uh, incoherence between uh, the, the central one and the discharge area. And so we speculate that the subsurface flow follows the white uh, that, uh, that line uh, from the sinking area to the discharge area. Next, please. And please note that uh, beyond the discharge, there is additional subsidence area, which uh, in the late uh, 2018 was discharge only, but in 2019, we already see a sinkhole formed there. So we also uh, could expect the sinkhole just by the subsidence uh, that occurred before. Next, please. Similarly, in the Hever fan, uh, we see areas of subsidence, of sinking, uh, the one that we saw in the picture, one of them is the one that we saw in, this, in the picture at the beginning, and an area where uh, water is discharged further to the east. Next, please. So the uh, surface runoff enters the sinkholes and continues all the way down to the, to the Dead Sea. And uh, you can see between the sink and the discharge, you can see a winding blue a subsidence, mild subsidence. So the next slide will show what is our uh, uh, interpretation where the subsurface flow goes from the sinking area to the discharge areas uh, in the east. Next, please. So if we focus on uh, the one that uh, was highlighted in the rectangle, we can also, yeah, we can also now uh, look at the time, uh, time series of subsidence after a flash flood. This is the work done by uh, Mayan Shviro in 2017. And here we can see uh, part of a time series of interferograms. Uh, the vertical blue lines below are the times of the floods. And the circles, the black circles, are the volumetric uh, subsidence rate uh, each time. Uh, as, and as we uh, go away from the flood in, toward the summer, we see that the rate of uh, subsidence decreases. So immediately after the flood, there is high subsidence. And as you uh, progress to the summer, you see lower, lower values. And then again, at the beginning of after the next flood, higher values and lower values at the end of the, of the summer. And again and again, and this is a time series that we already have for several years. And the, again, we'll go back uh, one minute. And so the uh, decay, decay constant, the characteristic decay is about 160 days, uh, 160 days for, for this uh, time series, decay of the subsidence. And so to explain that decay, we compare it in the next slide to a decay, decay uh, pattern of the uh, groundwater level in a nearby borehole. And we see that uh, the decay pattern of the uh, water level is uh, quite similar, it's about 140 days. And so this uh, gives us uh, an idea that uh, the, the subsidence decay is related to the amount of water that's available uh, for dissolution. So the subsidence is related directly to the uh, poten dissolution potential in this, in, uh, in this particular place. Next, please. We now go to a slightly different topic, also using uh, coherence in this case. Uh, and we want to estimate the volume of the flood by the coherence loss and also use some flow uh, simulation for that. So uh, we have here three interferograms, uh, co flood interferograms, and the amount of peak flow was measured in an in a, a hydrometric station upstream. So on the left, about three cubic meters a second, and on the right, 300 cubic meters a second, and in the middle, 30 cubic meters a second. And you can notice that the amount of uh, uh, coherence loss is a difference and, grow and growing from left to right. So we did that for several, inter oh, first, okay, next one. The reason for that is uh, the material added and removed during the flash floods uh, inside the riverbed. And uh, here we see a LIDAR, a yearly LIDAR, a differential map between 2018 and 2019, 
And in blue line, we see, in blue colors, we see material added. In uh, red, material uh, removed. And so we can see that these, hap these occur mainly in the stream beds as expected. So the next slide will show a, a, a mean coherence value of that rectangle that uh, we saw before. The, it's normalized to a reference area where the uh, flood water did not pass. So that is the, the background for each interferogram. And so we can see that for the lower, the, the lowest uh, flood volume, the 1.4, we see quite a high mean coherence. And for the highest, uh, 393 one, we see quite a low average, uh, average uh, coherence, uh, mean coherence. And the middle ones are on the way between so we can see a, quite a nice agreement between the volume uh, of flood water and the coherence loss in the riverbeds. We also uh, did some simulation. So put the cursor in the middle of the slide and press on it. And, the, and so the flow simulation, uh, this is a computer simulation based on tsunami square uh, methodology developed by uh, Stephen Ward from the uh, US uh, Santa Cruz. And it starts with pouring water on the left side of one cubic meter a second. And finally, uh, with uh, 20 cubic meters a second. And uh, as, as the water uh, continues, uh, more uh, braided the streams are filled with water according to the, to, the, um, to the DM that we use, uh, the 2019 uh, DM. So please uh, press on the side to continue. Yeah, so let's look at the rectangle that we did the coherence uh, measurements on. Next slide, please. And now if we uh, compare the simulation with the values that we put in the simulation with the coherence loss, we can see quite a nice agreement. This is in, in, in progress, this uh, study. So we, we have still some work to calibrate. Uh, our our measurements, but still we see nice agreement between the uh, simulation and the coherence loss, which let us uh, uh, think that uh, all the coherence loss is due to the flow of the water uh, in the riverbed. Next, please. And the, and, uh, the calibration curve between the uh, mean coherence and the peak volumetric flow is shown here with two uh, uh, outliers of the highest and the lowest uh, values of uh, peak flow. And these still need some uh, adjustment and understanding maybe the line is it will not be linear and uh, show some other kind of relationship. In this case, it's a log linear uh, line. Next, please. So what's the implication uh, of uh, our results? We see here the saline fan with the blue in the blue areas are the ones where the sinking uh, occurred, and the X uh, marks mark all the uh, riverbed that stopped flowing into the Dead Sea. Only one in the north continues flowing; all the others sink into the sinkholes. Next, please. Uh, on this, uh, uh, in Hever, you see that most of uh, of the Riverbeds continue all the way to the Dead Sea. And the implication of that is that uh, while the Dead Sea level drops, then the incision will continue backwards uh, from the Dead Sea and will endanger the, the road 90, which you can see here on the left bottom left side of the picture. And so in Hever, where the, the sinkhole did not collect all the water, the, the backward incision will uh, affect the main road, while in Salim, the previous one, it will not affect it anymore. So in, in, in terms of hazard, uh, this uh, sinking uh, mechanism uh, will likely to reduce the hazard on the main road and infrastructures uh, further to the west. Next, please. The reason for that is the slope and the, and the uh, uh, material with, within the riverbed. Both uh, in both riverbeds, in both areas, there are sinkholes within the riverbeds, but the Salim ones have a milder slope, the more moderate slope of one to three uh, degrees 
gradient and the hover have the highest uh, grade, which enable the gravel uh, to be carried down and fill the sinkhole, as we saw uh, in the first uh, pictures. And the water conti will continue directly to the Dead Sea, while in Salim, the water does not carry any gravel, any coarse material, and will just infiltrate into the sinkhole and cause those subsidence, wide subsidence bowls, which will not enable the runoff to continue all the way down uh, to the Dead Sea. The bottom side, next please. The bottom side, the bottom part, the yes, eastern part, minutes. okay? The bottom part of, uh, of the heavier one, the heavier uh, 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 river, beginning to be uh, at a more moderate slope, where also mud flats are exposed. And so we believe that uh, if this continues, then the same pro uh, process as in Salim occurs today will occur in Hever and may and, uh, maybe also in other riverbeds. So in the next slide, we see two other two examples of other riverbeds uh, in which uh, subsidence and sinkholes occur along the course of the river. And but in both of these rivers, the slope is uh, still uh, high, too high. The gradient is too high for for the water to to be carried to uh, continue flowing without coarse material, and thus they continue all the way down to the Dead Sea and uh, endanger the road uh, above or west of it, uh, as I showed before. Next, please. Okay. So to summarize, uh, we saw significant uh, subsidence and sinkhole formation uh, after flash flood due to increased uh, soil dissolution, maybe also due to uh, liquefaction as we saw uh, in the first picture and loss of cohesion uh, while uh, water dropped. Uh, subsurface dissolution channels were detected by, by INSAR. Uh, we estimated the flood volumes by uh, the coherence loss and uh, calibrated uh, by flow simulations. And uh, whether the river sink is a major factor in hazard assessment, as I uh, told you, by we but whether complete river sink will occur along all the other uh, Dead Sea rivers depends on the riverbed slopes and sediment load. And of course, this is also uh, to be uh, looked for uh, in the bathymetry as the Dead Sea is going to, to the level is going to drop in a, in a future years, then uh, possibly a, a lower gradient uh, stream will be exposed uh, in places which are covered by water now. Thank you. Thank you, Kidon. We had our five presentations in this session and we have now 50 minutes for question and answers. And I suggest to go in the order of the presentations. So to start with Anurag, I see one question and one comment for you. So the question, sinkholes are abundant in Denna, but the size is normally smaller than 30 meters. Is it feasible to detect this? Yeah, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, yes, I think it is uh, feasible to detect uh, those uh, sinkholes as well. Um, their diameter is uh, small. Uh, however, I would suggest uh, uh, the PS points to be retrieved from a data set with higher spatial resolution so that the PS density uh, in the area is higher. Or uh, also, uh, Distributed scatterings are uh, could be an interesting alternative to retrieve the deformation time series over that area. So yeah, I think yes, it, it is feasible. The results are common for you. Yeah, uh, I read the comment. Uh, so thanks, uh, Francesca. I did download the paper and uh, and uh, uh, thanks for suggesting it. Uh, it looks interesting. I will see how it could be useful for me. Thanks. Uh, next series was uh, one. One question for you. I have one. Maybe you who are presenting the some layers for the users, and in that layers you have interferograms along with uh, shape files. 
I'm curious to know the users, what did we say about the, the, the programs? Were they able to understand, are they able to understand them, them? Or they were just looking at your uh, shape file? Oh, okay, thank you for uh, the question. Did, can you hear me? I'm sorry. Yes. Yeah, okay. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, yes, so um, the first uh, interface I showed, we, holding uh, both uh, uh, shapefiles and the raster data, the interferograms, is for internal use. Uh, it's only for, for us uh, to help us uh, uh, highlight the uh, subsiding areas. And the end users, the, the stakeholders, the unprofessional, they are unprofessional uh, with INSAR data. And uh, we, we do not uh, share that with them. They only expose to the uh, shape files uh, uh, specifically to, to avoid uh, any misunderstanding or misinterpretations uh, of the data. Okay, thank you. Uh, there is a question. Yes, sorry. <laughs> there is a question for Max. Um, wouldn't be a better fitting model than simple linear trend be more useful? Yes, thank you, Maya, for the question. Um, yes, as you can see, uh, another model might be more useful because you can clearly see in uh, a seasonal trend. But my methodology was mainly to keep it a little bit simple. Um, also, because from this linear model, um, we estimated the, the we calculated the residuals and then estimated the uh, standard deviation. It's 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 okay, not entirely correct. And that's one uh, answer. And the second one is um, uh, you can also play with different uh, update strategies. So um, um, how do you update the linear model? That's 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 my answer. Thank you. There is a uh, one more question. Uh, have you tested the method in locations with larger re regions of displacement? For example, if you have multiple targets affected by displacement, the arc between uh, them will show no displacement. How would you run against this in uh, operational system? Yeah, so thank you for the question. Um, so my main goal of this uh, method was to detect mid and very small sized uh, deformations. Um, because I'm looking at a, an urban area, the sinkholes tend to be quite small and uh, therefore the observations can be quite sparse. If I would uh, uh, encounter a, a relatively large sinkhole, then um, you probably see a lot of uh, arcs coming from the edges towards the um, location where the phenomenon is happening. Um, the downside of using uh, larger areas is uh, that the uh, number of arcs will increase quite a lot. So if you, so for example, in my presentation, I used 61 points and it already created more than 1800 arcs. If you would incorporate more points, it would be even way more. Thus, uh, this methodology is mainly effective in uh, smaller subsets. Thank you. Thank you. I also have a question I may ask. So you developing an anomaly detection methodology mm -hmm. and say if I'm flagging this area and if you go to the user that says I'm flagging these areas, I suppose the obvious question is how much does it move? Mm -hmm. But then you don't know yeah. because of the ambiguity. So do you have some experience from some answers from the users about this problem? The main goal of this methodology was to detect anomalies and not necessarily detect how much it moves because uh, our goal is to look for points which behave like not how we would expect it and then our next step is to really investigate that particular area does that answer your question yes okay thank you there is then a question for uh, Farnus. you can have a look at it. yes yes read it and then provide the answer okay i see first thank you for the kind words whoever wrote this message for me and uh, then um the answer to the question 
uh, would be so uh, one of our points that uh, are uh, like mutual between uh, like the two stations that we have are going to like, they are included uh, in the final map. It's not like a PS thing. Um, but uh, like whatever points that is mutual between the two uh, the two geometries um, uh, that has like a, a coherence higher than a threshold and it's not outlier uh, is included in uh, the final map. Uh, and if you're talking about, I don't think you're talking about uh, the uh, the key point selection because if you're talking about that, what I used for the key point selection to Register the DMs with a SIFT algorithm. Uh, about the second question, how did you tackle phase in interferences as the imaging geometry is weak? Uh, so the imaging geometry is weak, but uh, the the stations are are still like somewhere from half a kilometer to a kilometer apart. So I don't know how strong the interference would be. I'm not aware of anything special that we do for the interferences. Thank you. Don't see any other question for you. There's a final one for John. Would it be easier to link loss of coherence to surfaces rather than volumes? Uh, yeah, there's another question before that by Anurag about the presence of uh, water, high soil moisture due to flash floods cause the correlation. So you are right, the uh, water and uh, the moisture may also cause the correlation. As long as they are in uh, in the stream beds, we we refer to them in a similar manner as we refer to gravel movement. So they are affected by high water level, and so the the wider stream the stream beds will have wider decorrelated zones, not necessarily due to gravel uh, carriage by the water, but also due to moisture uh, and water. Uh, a high water level. So you are right, and for for the cor the correlation uh, uh, measurements, it is the same for us because that that actually tells us how wide are the the flowing streams. Uh, is that okay? The question answered. And the second one, um, wouldn't it be easier to link loss of coherence to surface? The surfaces rather than volumes. Uh, if you mean surface on the on the map on the on the stream bed, yes, we do it by the surface, not by the volume. The volume is the volume of water that we measure uh, at the hydrometric uh, station above. So we calibrate volumes of water in the hydrometric station to surfaces. Uh, in the uh, incoherent map. So I hope I understood the question correctly, but we do it to surface. The volumes are the water. Thanks. I don't see any more questions. So do you see more questions from the audience? Aya? No, I don't see any more questions in the chat, but uh, maybe you have a question to run. I don't know, or someone from the presenters? No, if not, uh, this was the, the Q&A session. So maybe to the presenters, if you have the opportunity here to suggest or to recommend something yeah, for the operation of the satellite, the sentinel. If you want to say something, go ahead. You also have the opportunity to put to the recommendations tomorrow the plenary session we will have at the plenary 11 30. plenary session will be together with the earthquake and the environment say something zero
Tiene. If not, I remember you that we have the first session at four o'clock. And um, I think that's all. Isa? Yes, that's, uh, I, thank you very much for your sharing. And uh, as Nancy already anticipated, if you have any recommendations for tomorrow's plenary, please send them even to end mail so we can. Uh, gather those together uh, with all the other uh, little recommendations. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And thank you very much. Thank you. Bye bye. For part of the session tomorrow. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks again.